This is a webinar on the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on the digital media and technology arena. Uh, my name is Russell Feldman and I head up YouGov's digital media and technology research team. And there will be an opportunity to, to submit any questions in the chat function of the Zoom meeting, which should be at the bottom of your screen, uh, in which case I'll take them at the end of this uh, webinar. And also the recording and um, the slide pack will be sent out um, at a later date. So I'm going to kick off now. Um, this webinar, we're going to focus on a number of different areas. The first one is essentially who are YouGov and what research did we conduct? Um, we then look at the kind of beginning or what we call kind of some context to give some understanding of what's happened over time before the pandemic in terms of technology and service ownership and penetration. We then move into changes in behaviour where we look at what happened in April, we're essentially in the heart of lockdown versus July where restrictions of, uh, of the lockdown eased and then look at uh, some, some essentially some winners who's done really well out of the pandemic and the lockdown and then just some final thoughts. So why did we do this research? Um, obviously everyone is um, fully aware of what the coronavirus pandemic has done to our country and uh, obviously the world. Um, it has changed the way we live. And whilst there has been many studies um, looked at on the kind of mental and health and well-being, as well as the economic um, issues surrounding the pandemic, we haven't yet seen any real published data on digital media and technology, uh, particularly in the UK. So we decided to conduct two surveys. One we conducted in April, in the heart of the lockdown with a nationally representative population of um, 2,000 people um, and then a further one with the same, uh, same questions conducted in July when the restrictions have eased. Um, that gives us a kind of pre and post, almost sorry I should say during um, the heart of lockdown and as uh, restrictions eased to understand what's gone on in terms of um, people uh, accessing services and certain behaviours. Um, in terms of YouGov, um, uh, you, I'm sure you're all aware of who we are, but we are a, um, we are a data analytics and research organisation headquarters in the UK with offices around the world. Um, we are um, um, uh, 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 growing in, uh, in numbers in terms of our employees and our research. Um, we, were, um, we were founded in 2000 and um, in uh, obviously uh, we're now 20 years old. Okay so in terms of um, the areas that we're going to focus on today we focus on four and um, the first one is kind of looking at feelings towards the pandemic, services used within the home and things like that. Uh, the second is then looking at the use of pay tv, um, video streaming services, broadband usage, music and audio servicing uh, services and gaming and things like that. Um, then we look at the ways how people communicate during the pandemic. Um, we've all seen the rise of um, Zoom calls and team meetings and so on and so forth, as well as other things as well, looking at the rise of online gaming and online services such as um, digital online services, um, such as uh, different types of audio. Um, as well as that though, we are looking at how the lockdown changed behaviour from April and then kind of understand what's gone on in, um, in July once the um, uh, restrictions started to ease. But before that, let's just look at a bit of context about what's happened um, over time. So in, if we look at um, what people, what, what kind of four, uh, sorry, three in, kind of three key infrastructure services that people have in the home, 87% um, of the population have broadband. 87% um, also have uh, access to a smartphone and use it and just under two-thirds have a traditional landline phone and if we were looking at by age um, over the 55s have obviously more uh, are more likely to have um, access to a telephone landline whereas amongst the 25 to 34 year old bracket just um, a third of them have a traditional uh, telephone landline uh, now. Um, in terms of um, traditional kind of computing devices, we obviously saw tablet penetration peak in around about 2013, 2014, where, um, with uh, the first introduction of the uh, iPad 
in uh, I think it was 2010. Uh, since then, uh, we saw growth uh, up to about 68% in 2018 that uh, of households had a tablet. Um, within two years, we've actually seen that decline by 10 percentage points. So um, there was obviously a big um, uh, kind of um, increase in tablet penetration over the years, but now that started to wane. And actually, we are now looking at what we call the connected home, which is really starting to come into the market. And we've been tracking this market since 2017, but on a kind of, um, if we look at first half of 2018, which is the purple there, compare it to the first half of 2020, we see massive growth in many of these kind of smart IoT technology. Smart speaker, for instance, has grown from 10% in 2018 and is now over a quarter at 27% in 2020. Smart thermostats continue to increase from 6 to 8%. So smart security, things like ring doorbells and so on, have in, uh, doubled in growth in two years, uh, as does smart lighting, almost increasing in growth. And smart domestic appliances, things like smart ovens or smart dishwashers and things like that, have also grown. Um, they're at 6%. We did have a figure for first half of 2020, but it was less than half a percent, so we didn't um, put it down. But you can see there is massive growth in the kind of um, connected home market. And we tend to see that growth um, 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 just over the kind of festive period. So um, you can see this line chart goes back all the way to the first half of 2017, uh, sorry, the second half of 2017. All the way through to the first half of 2020 um, and we had the different periods of research um, every single time we did um, h2s they were always conducted before the black friday event in november um, so usually in october time around about that but what we tend to see is that um, during the year if we look at say um, 2018 there's no major differences between first half and second half with um, smart home um, around about 18%. It's only after the festive period where people starting to buy things like smart speakers or going in to get smart thermostats and so on, where you see massive growth. So if you look at um, H218 to H119, you can see a seven percentage point increase. The same with H219 and H120, where it's increased by eight percentage points there. And that 34% of smart, um, smart connected homes around equates for almost 10 million UK households. So massive amounts of people having at least one or more of those smart devices that we mentioned earlier, either a smart thermostat, smart speaker, smart security, smart lighting or smart domestic appliances. Um, okay, so um, one of the things that we wanted to also look at is around about infrastructure. And there was uh, lots of concern during the lockdown where you know, everyone having internet and having internet access all, and all at the same time, is that going to essentially break the internet? And all the uh, broadband com companies quite rightly said, no, we're going to be fine, as did the mobile telcos. They all said fine. Um, and this is the kind of data um, satisfaction that we saw for some of these devices here. So what we're showing here is um, really a kind of 10 point scale where one is very poor and 10 is excellent. And we've taken the mean score. So if we look at home broadband, we've just looked at, say, some KPIs there and we asked how satisfied or, or how, how, you know, thinking about your broadband connection, how um, would you rate it in terms of one being very poor and 10 being excellent. And actually, by and large, most of the um, infrastructures that we have here are having, you know, very good ratings, um, eights or high sevens in some cases. And we've also got data there for 5G. So people that have 5G uh, in their tariff, you can see are significantly higher than um, normal mobile data. But we have seen obviously some high, high profile network outages. The media has reported on them, um, uh, particularly for Virgin Media and Sky and one or two others where there have been some creeks in the network. And actually what, despite those kind of high ratings that we saw, we actually do see some um, declines in some of these kind of broadband performance um, between April and July. In April, if we're looking at top three box now, uh, reliability, 71% of those that had a broadband connection rated it an eight, nine or 10. And um, that's dropped in July to 65%. And 
And in by and large, most of these different metrics here have seen declines, particularly reliability and staying connected. And one other question that we really uh, that we asked about broadband um, uh, users as well was, have they experienced any of the following when they've used it in the last couple of weeks or months? And we actually saw that um, a third of people said that their speeds have got worse, whilst four percent have said it got better. Just over a quarter have said they had a worse connection compared to three percent that said they had a better connection, and over a third, thirty-six percent there, said that they've experienced buffering now which is uh, obviously related to playing videos or audio clips so people are recognizing that there are still some issues despite rating some of their um, um their broadband uh, providers quite high okay so let's move on to essentially april and what happened during the heart of the lockdown um if we look here we these are a number of subscription services that people may have starting with video screaming at the top there all the way down to uh, like a digital news subscription and then we've got other subs um, but essentially three quarters of the population have a video streaming subscription in April yeah, so essentially having uh, access to say um, you know, Netflix or Disney Plus or, or, or whatever it was um, we've seen over half had a pay TV service um, just under half had a, a musical audio streaming service things like Spotify or if they've been audible or something like that 15% had a subscription to an online gaming service, that could be things like Xbox Live or PS Now. 12% uh, had a, a, a sports subscription and 11% had a digital news subscription with 7% had, having others. If we look at the kind of average consumer, most of the, um, when we look at that in terms of the kind of mean of, of what uh, number of subscriptions people had, it's around the 2.2 mark in, in April. However, there were um, considerable differences by age. Um, under 35s were more likely to have um, more subscriptions than over 35. So what we see here is that under 35s, um, the average number of um, services that they had is 2.47, compared to over 35s, which is 2.11. And as one may expect, the kind of subscription usage also differs by the platform. Under 35s, for instance, have a lot more different services compared to the over um, 35s, none more so than pay TV, with the under 35s significantly less likely to have a pay TV subscription than over 35s. That's 36% of them versus 60% of the over 35s. Um, amongst though, uh, the other services, the under 35s are significantly more, more likely to have a, a video on uh, subscription, a music or audio subscription, and an online gaming subscription than the over 35. So key differences by age, as you, as you probably would expect there to be. Um, if we look at different online subscription services, we're just picking on three here. We're looking at video services on the left, the uh, SVOD, uh, music and audio in the middle, and online gaming to the right. And what we asked was, thinking of the lockdown in April, um, due to the coronavirus outbreak, have you subscribed to more, um, subscribe to less, or have the same amount of, um, on, um, on, on uh, services for each thing, uh, for each particular element? And what we saw is, by and large, most people are actually getting more subscriptions than less. Um, obviously, a large chunk keeping the same amount of subscriptions, but if we look at SFOD, for instance, whilst 80% had the same amount of subscriptions before the lockdown, 17% have actually stated that they've increased the number of subscriptions. So perhaps they had a Disney Plus, uh, uh, sorry, a Netflix, and then perhaps they um, got a Disney Plus or an Amazon Prime or something like that. Um, the same for music and audio. So 5% have increased the number of services, just 2% have not. And in terms of gaming, 79% have the same number of services that they had before the lockdown, but again, 14% have now more. And interestingly, on gaming, of those gamers in particular, the proportion of them who had kind of bought more games, either for physically or, or downloading, um, had also increased. So we saw that 9% had bought more physical games in April, and um, just under a third had bought more downloadable games, given a net of around about 36%. So people recognise that they're going to be in lockdown in April for a long time, obviously to keep themselves entertained, they've gone and bought um, more games to, um, to ensure that they can um, do that. 
Um, before the lockdown, if we now focus on some of the kind of platform usage that we see here, this um, so video and uh, keeping in touch type platforms, this is what we saw before lockdown with 73% of the population saying that they used WhatsApp. You can see other things there, Skype, Skype at 26%, Zoom at 5% and so on. If we then compare it to what happens during April and ask people what they did during the lockdown, we actually see differences as well. So WhatsApp was 73%, it increased to 76%, a, a, a small but um, obviously modest increase there. But the big winners really are if you look at Skype, which increased by five percentage points from 26 to 31 there. And Zoom in particular has done very, very well from 5% to 28. And also House Party there from 1% to now 10% in April, stating that they were using these platforms then, which were obviously um, good to keep in touch with friends and family. So that's kind of given us a, a quick flavour of what happened really in April. If we now then can compare that to what's happened since the easing of lockdown, the first thing we want to look at here is essentially what people have been doing and different types of things that they were doing in April and then July. So we've got dark purple there is April and the kind of lighter purple there is July. And for each of these things, so things like avoiding public places, improving hygiene and so on and so forth, there has been mostly a decline in the number of um, people doing these things. So as you would expect with lockdown restrictions, these people are, all, are more on the streets more. It's only when we look at things like wearing a face mask, which I think came into prevalence around mid July. So just around about this, um, we finished um, conducting the field work for July. We did see massive increases in the proportion that said that they were wearing a face mask. But by and large, most people have kind of um, reduced the number of things, especially on things like hygiene even. 80% um, said they improved their hygiene in um, April. In July, that's down by eight percentage points to 72%. Um, we also saw interest, um, differences in the number of subscriptions or services that people had. By and large, most of these things remain fairly static or have gone up or down by one percentage point here or there but it's actually pay TV that has seen the largest um, significant decrease. Um, in April, um, over half said that they had a pay TV subscription, 53% there. That's now down by five percentage points um, with, uh, in July to 48% saying that they had a pay TV subscription. And that also is um, in relation to the number of subscriptions that people um, have. In April, it was the average was 2.2. And in July, that's down to 2.11. So again, slightly down than what it was. And again, if we look at the kind of differences by age, it's actually the under 35s that are driving this. In April, the, their average was 2.47. That's now down to 2.35. Whereas amongst the over 35s, it's relatively static at 2.11 in April, around about 2.12 in July. So no key differences there, but it's really the under 35s that are driving this reduction in the uh, average number of services um, declining. Um, and with the numbers of subscriptions being cut back, if we look at the um, amongst the, uh, the under 35s, in April, 46% had three or more subscriptions. Yet in July, this, actually, this figure is now reduced to 40%, 40 which is obviously directly um, in relation to that 2.35 number of um, subscriptions that people had. So it does reflect the number of subscriptions going down. And um, when we look at what they've actually declined the number of 35s, everything is relatively static apart from pay TV. And remember that pay TV amongst the under 35s was significantly less than the over 35s anyway. But even amongst those that had pay TV, it has reduced by six percentage points, which is a, um, a significant decline in those three or four months in eight, since April. We're also seeing other declines for online gaming that's just gone down by 20, um, from 28 to 25. Everything else is relatively the same. And um, if we now move on to the uh, types of communication and social media platforms that people use, um, what we found was that in April, um, we saw that those people that were using Zoom, 87% were saying that they were using them more. You can see that across the board, people were using 
the, um, the platforms and social media networks more. If you look at TikTok, for instance, 68% of TikTok users in April were using it more than they previously were. Now, if we compare that to July, with, eight, um, with the July line there, that light purple, and the April line there, the dark purple, of the proportion of people saying that they were using these networks more, um, again, if we focus on TikTok, 68%, um, as I said on the other slide, were using TikTok more than they were. In July, that actually is the only network that has seen um, more um, uh, people using it more since, um, with all the other networks um, just declining there on the proportion of views uh, that state that they are using their social media network more than they used to. If we look at that on, say, video calling and communication platforms, um, what we've got here are kind of three um, uh, points, data points. We've got pre-lockdown, the April percentage, and then the July percentage. Um, and as you would imagine, since the easing of restrictions, classic platform usage has kind of stabilised for the majority of these. Um, if you look at Skype, it was 26% pre-lockdown, it went up, and now it's down to about 26% again. Um, but it's really Zoom that have we seen um, still considerably uh, people using it from 5% now up to 42%. I think in the middle there it was about 28%. So people are still using Zoom and I suspect that is related to um, a lot of the home workers that are still not gone back into the office, into um, where their offices were. And also probably still related to some consumers still using it, um, uh, although um, obviously restrictions have eased. Okay, if we now focus on the changes in consumption, what we've got here are, um, this is looking at April and looking at the differences between the different types of content or genres there are on pay TV. So amongst pay TV users, what were they doing in April? And if, for instance, we look at news, we saw that 54% of them were watching news more so, and 9% were watching it less in April. You can see, um, by and large, most people were watching most of these content more so than less. It's only when you look at things like sports, which as you would expect, they, people are watching sports less than they would than they used to, with obviously the um, postponing of many um, fixtures uh, on there. But, however, in July, we do see decreases of consumption, particularly in news. So as we said, there was an increase uh, in, in April of 54% of people use, watching the news more. That's now down to 41% as does fitness and well-being that went from seven percent of people kind of using fitness and well-being genres uh, and, and content that's one from seven to four percent and actually there's been increases particularly for sport watching where it's gone from four percent to nine percent watching more and that is probably relating to the um, um, finishing off of the seasons particularly on the EFL and the Premier League that has helped increase that kind of people watching those content um, also, we see differences in the types of um, video services that people are using. So all brands in, in April, um, this is what we had. So 85% of those that had a, a um, video streaming subscription were using Netflix, 65% were using Prime Video, 25% Disney Plus and so on. Um, what we then saw in July was some increases. So particularly um, Prime Video went from 65% to 68%. But Disney Plus has done very well, going from a quarter of people using Disney Plus in April up to 30% now in July. And that brand, if you remember, Disney Plus only launched, I think it was um, around about the 24th of March, um, just after lockdown. So that brand in particular has done very well. Other brands like BritBox has managed to double its, um, uh, its uh, share from 2% to now 4%. And Apple TV have also done well from 8% to 12%. Um, if we then look at um, music and audio, again, we see some differences in some of the brands. So in April, 68% that had a music or audio subscription were using Spotify. That's now increased in July to 71%. Uh, for Amazon Music Unlimited, that was 24%, it's now slightly down to 22%. Uh, Apple Music remains the same at 13%. Audible would actually increase from 13% to 15% and other differences there. But there has been some um, changes um, as, as you may expect 
since um, the easing of lockdown. Okay, so now let's just look at the future and what's um, uh, kind of happening and what's going to happen. So in terms of how much people were spending on their subscriptions, in April, the proportion of people spending £30 or more was um, there were about 36, uh, the average was about £36 um, pounds people were spending. In July, sorry, it's 36%, not pounds, that's a typo there. So um, of those spending £30 or more in April, it's actually 36% were, um, were doing that. In July, that's down by 10 percentage points to 26% spending £30 or more. And of those people that were intending to subscribe to services in the next three months or so, we've seen declines as well. So in April for pay TV, we saw that 9% of, um, sorry, for SFOD, um, we saw that 9% um, of those that didn't have SFOD in April were in, intending to get an SFOD subscription in the next three months. For music and audio, that was 7%. For pay TV, that was 6% and for online gaming that was 5%. In July, we've actually seen declines. Um, in, um, so if we focus on SFOD, 7% now expect to get an, uh, an online subscription if they didn't. For music and audio, that's down by one percentage point to six. Um, uh, pay TV remains static at 6%, and online gaming has also decreased by 1%. Whilst these are kind of not, uh, are quite modest declines, they are declines across the board uh, nonetheless and does kind of in, um, you know, impact what people are going to do and what they're um, going to spend their money on. If we focus on those people that said they were going to get pay TV though, and that 6% represents a, lum a large number of households, just under a million households were intending to get pay TV in the next three months. And if we look at where they're likely to go, the direction of traffic, a third or so intending to get Sky, 20% uh, expected to get Virgin Media um, and 9% um, EE TV and 7% BT TV. And however, a large proportion there at 29% are unsure what pay TV provider they're likely to go to. If we look at the same for music and audio, um, we see that around about 1.56 million individuals now uh, were looking to get a music or audio subscription in the next three months. A third looking to choose Spotify as their destination, 15% um, um, looking to get Amazon Prime Music Unlimited, and you can see differences there as well, 6%, uh, sorry, 13% expecting to get Apple Music, 6% audio, uh, Audible, and 7% YouTube or um, Premium. Again, a quarter, which represents about 400,000 people, are still up for grabs. People are unsure what, what service they're likely to get. Um, so essentially, is the reduction in intent because we are kind of getting back to normal? And there is that kind of feeling that has restrictions as kind of eased. Why should you continue to do things online when you can do it face to face? And we see that as well with some of the um, kind of more hygienic factors that we've um, kind of mentioned earlier. Things like avoiding public places declining and avoiding contact with people also declines. Um, it's also interesting, the people taking part in video calls and online fitness classes have also declined. When we also look at, is this kind of related to people wanting to save money? We looked at um, our, um, we've got a study called our Household Economic Tracker, which essentially tracks how um, consumers feel about the economy and about their financial well-being. And in April, things were pretty bad. I mean, we, what we have here is like an index figure. Um, and we've split this amongst the 18 to 34s and the map rep because there are differences. Essentially, anything below 100 points is bad and anything above 100 points is good. As you may expect, in April, things were pretty bleak. Um, it was, we're seeing around about um, uh, at the index of 80, uh, 80 points there for both 18 to 34s and the net rep population. But interestingly, whilst the, um, whilst the 18 to 34s have been decreasing the number of online services since um, April to July, so they've got fewer of them, um, their financial kind of outlook is actually increased more so than the NatRep population. You can see there that it's, whilst it's still negative at 94 um, points, it's nearer the 100 uh, kind of um, 
average target than we would expect compared to the net rep figure at 90. So 18 to 34 year olds are actually a little bit more optimistic about their financial outlook than the total population. So what we can kind of um, see here is that whilst they are reducing the number of services um, since April to, to July, they've gone down, they are more likely to be probably spending money on kind of face-to-face -face services rather than online. If we look at news as well, we also see that the kind of um, news has had quite a negative factor um, during the pandemic. And um, what we have here are a number of kind of uh, agreement statements. And we've just looked at here the kind of top two box, which is essentially strongly agree and agree. And this um, again, April is the dark purple and July is the light purple. Um, and we ask some questions about the media and how they report on the pandemic. And interestingly, um, over half of, um, of uh, consumers feel that the media always focuses on negative news. Went from 55% and that's increased just slightly to July to 57%. Not significant, but increases nonetheless. What is a significant increase, however, is something around the news being truthful. And a third or just over a third of um, respondents said that they felt that um, they couldn't rely on the news to be true um, in April. That's now increased to just under half in July. And that obviously has a, a, a very large um, detrimental impact amongst these kind of news publications, um, particularly on how much they trust and what they report back. Uh, we've all seen how uh, the daily briefings and the journalists on them, and uh, I don't know if you, you saw kind of, uh, if you followed uh, Twitter on some of these journalists, but they were getting so much stick because they just focused on the negative and we're trying to spin things that the politicians were saying. Um, if we look at um, something like fearful of watching news because of the outbreak, we actually see that's declined because people are kind of a bit more perhaps bubbly about how, how the lockdown has helped kind of um, reduce the, the, the deaths and, and the kind of um, the, the infection rate and people are perhaps a bit more optimistic about things getting back to normal. So. In April, a fifth of people said that they were fearful of watching the news because of the outbreak. That's now down to 13%, so it has decreased. Okay, if we now kind of focus on the winners um, of essentially of the pandemic, which doesn't really sound great, but I'm more talking about the brands which have essentially won lockdown. I'm going to focus on these five because these, these brands have done really well. If we focus on, say, Netflix, um, we see 85% of video subscribers use Netflix. And it's kind of seen as a really valuable brand, particularly where, you know, um, to, to, you know with entertainment, it's really helped uh, consumers and, and they kind of value it now. If we look at Disney Plus, they probably had a very, very successful story. They launched at the end of March. Um, in April, about a quarter of, um, of those that had a video on demand subscription were using Disney Plus. That's now increased to 30%. Of video on demand um, of, of that population so really increased. Zoom as well has obviously increased exponentially so it's 42% um, of people are using Zoom to um, you know speak to friends and family as well as obviously work colleagues. Spotify has also done very well with almost 70% of people that have a music or audio subscription using that brand and TikTok as well have obviously done very very well. Um, if you remember TikTok was really a brand which was focused on the kind of tween market if we if we were say going back to last year it was more of a brand focusing on them but since lockdown it has seen um, lots of celebrities using it and um, many adults using it as well and we've seen that 71 percent are using TikTok um, more so than they did previously so the brand has done very very well so much so that obviously President Trump doesn't like them anymore and wants Microsoft to buy them um, to ensure that um, there is no kind of backdoor to the Chinese market, uh, sorry, to the Chinese uh, infrastructure and security problems that um, has been um, kind of in the media for a, a long, long time. If we just focus on um, Disney Plus, because uh, that is a brand that obviously launched in, in the pandemic um, and has, has had a pretty good success story. And this is data from our brand index uh, daily tracking, uh, brand tracking study. And if we look at awareness of Disney Plus, it has increased since the 1st of March there till the um, 31st of July. And it has in increased over time. Obviously, before um, they launched, they did lots of promotional 
um, TV adverts and um, newspaper and print adverts as well to help get the um, awareness up. But that's obviously increased during lockdown. Um, the impression of Disney Plus as well has also increased significantly from around about five in March time to ending up around about the 20 or 24 percent or sorry, 22 um, percentage point there. So it's done very, very well in terms of having a positive impression, as well as that consideration to purchase has also increased from just around about five or so in March, now up to about 20 in July. So the brand has done very, very well in essentially um, what has been a very tough time um, with, uh, for consumers. OK, so now we're just going to focus on wrapping up and uh, looking at the kind of takeouts. Um, since the midst of the pandemic, we have seen spending on subscriptions have reduced, as well as the intention to have services. We've seen April to July, um, people looking to get an SVOD or a pay TV subscription has been going down. This doesn't necessarily mean it's just for economic reasons. Um, I think we are seeing because people are essentially let out again, means that they can spend on other things. We've seen um, you know, much of the kind of media focus on the negativity around the pandemic and what it's done to the economy and high streets. Um, but actually, people are still going out to now high streets when they can, and they are still going shopping um, to buy clothes and, and whatnot, rather than groceries, what they, they could only do during lockdown. So people are spending again, just on different things. Obviously, the pandemic has had a massive impact on the economy. Um, and those kind of higher spending services, I do think are likely to be cut back. And we've already seen that with pay TV. Obviously, pay TV, the likes of having the Sky or Virgin Media subscription is likely to be like 30 plus pounds, as well as you know, if you want on, um, subscriptions to say movies or sports, that's adding on extras as well. I suspect we're likely to see more of what we call cord shaving, where people will still have subscriptions to Sky, but they may um, look at reducing some of those other services that they have. And perhaps they might actually um, subscribe to say video um, services like a Disney Plus rather than getting the um, Sky Movies channel, for example. So we're likely to see that happen. And even though there is this, we're in the middle of a recession, we've already seen the Bank of England, I think it, um, he came out last week and said that there's already evidence of it becoming more V-shaped than U-shaped um, because people are essentially out there now and they're spending their money, whereas before they could only spend their money in, in, on a number of different things. And I think the thing here is that consumers will still spend money in the recession, but they are essentially more fussy on what they spend their money on. They may not necessarily go out to a restaurant, but they will spend money on getting a takeaway. So um, as an example, so people will still be spending money, but I think this is where that brand halo effect will have a massive impact, particularly on those services where consumers may look to re um, re remove. Uh, and this is where if they have had a bad um, experience with that particular brand, they are more likely to move that bad experience of that brand um, over another one, for example. Um, so that's where brand strength is going to be key, particularly in this market. Um, even in recessions, you know, brands still need to kind of get their brand identity and their values across to consumers to ensure that those consumers will still value them. And lastly, consumers do have money, but confidence is shaky even during the recession, as you may expect. Um, it's probably fair to say that media does have a, a large um, responsibility to play in the part of a, the recovery. Unfortunately, consumers are essentially fed up of the negativity in the news. We saw that with some of the slides that I uh, some of the stats there that I, that I um, uh, showed you. Um, consumers understand what the pandemic has done, but they almost want more of a more balanced view. They don't trust the media. They want a, a kind of better way of understanding what's going on rather than having uh, particular spins on it. So the newspapers and um, TV broadcaster news uh, areas need to do better on um, helping consumers because ultimately no one wants a recession. Everyone wants things to get back to normal. Um, as quickly as possible. Um, that's the end of the slides. I will certainly take uh, questions now. Yes, Russell. So uh, the first question we have is from Faye and she asks, what drives the smart home growth devices more? Black Friday, Christmas gifting or Christmas and Boxing Day sales? Oh, that's a great question. Um, when we've done research over it, we actually see an, um, all three of them are growing it. Um, 
what in Black Friday, um, if you look at things like smart speakers, Amazon is certainly the number one kind of um, kind of leader in smart speaker growth. And essentially, what Amazon are very good at doing is they get rid of their own, own old stock and replace it with new stock. So in Black Friday, they essentially get rid of their old, uh, their kind of last year's Echo devices because they want to make stock rooms for stock for the new ones. So they are likely to do discounted uh, kind of smart speakers and so on and so forth, and that helps. The other thing um, around the Christmas uh, market, um, uh, aside from the Black Friday market, is essentially gifting is huge for smart speakers, and that also helps the, the kind of uh, the growth of it. And we also see growth amongst existing users. So it's not just people gifting to people that may not have a um, smart speaker, but people that have a smart speaker in, say, their lounge, are now more likely to go out and buy another one and put it in their kitchen or their bedroom or something like that. So we're kind of seeing two kind of revenue streams there, one from existing users and one from new users. Um, but essentially, it's, it's all related to the sales and also the gifting market that has helped increase that kind of um, smart speaker um, uh, kind of bubble increasing. Other things like um, smart thermostats um, is kind of an interesting thing because obviously in the winter, that's um, hugely popular for, for seeing increases in smart thermostats and a lot of marketing of say Hive and Google Nest goes on in the winter months. Um, I would actually argue that that's the wrong time to do it. I would actually say if you do it during the spring or summer where people are more likely to service their boilers, they are more likely to service their boiler and perhaps get, um, get a um, smart, um, smart thermostat as well, rather than waiting in the winter and kind of being let down um, waiting for an engineer to install it. So yeah, there, there are certainly growths across, but I'd certainly say smart speakers are seeing the, the largest growth um, of, of driving the smart home market. Thanks, Russell. Um, we also have a question from Laura, who has asked, how much do you think the reduction in pay TV subscriptions is due to Disney Plus um, free first month offer wearing off? Um, I think, yeah, I think it is certainly um, having an impact. Um, I think the first month offer, and I think they did something where if you subscribe, I think it was like something like 60 quid for the year rather than 5.99 a month. So you could save yourself around about 10 or 12 quid over the space of the year. I think that has certainly helped. I don't think it's certainly ensured that we've seen called cutting where people have essentially stopped subscribing to Sky or Virgin. I just think it's perhaps they've become a bit more savvy and decided that instead of spending 10 or 15 pounds a month for Sky Movies or, or Sky Cinema, what it's, what it's called now, they've probably gone to Disney Plus to get perhaps those movies. So, so Disney Plus has done well and perhaps some of those um, kind of additional services have, have decreased. Russell, Lauren has asked, um, regarding the increase in video conferencing, where does Microsoft Teams appear? I see Zoom increase, but would have assumed Teams would have too. Um, we, unfortunately, I suspect Teams has increased. It's just, unfortunately, we didn't put it in um, in the questionnaire um, in April. So we felt it was wrong to put it in July. Um, so um, unfortunately, I can only go on anecdotal data there um, where I think it has increased, but that's probably more of um, in, the, in the B2B environment. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't really um, give a percentage on that. Russell, Monica's asked, have you looked at other media channels such as radio, print, or out of home advertising? Uh, we did look at newspapers and, and print um, and so on. And we did see, obviously, there have been large scale numbers of people saying that it's been declining. And, and we saw that as well, unfortunately, where um, uh, people haven't been going to, to essentially go out and buy a newspaper during the pandemic anymore. Um, whether or not that's to stay away from them, the bad news or because they're, they're watching it all the time being um, sat at home, um, we couldn't really say, but unfortunately it has declined. Laura has asked, regarding the distrust in the media, have you concluded it's because of issues with the media outlets, but the data but can the data really distinguish between the distrust of media outlets and the distrust of politicians who are providing the content? Um, we focused, the question was related to the, regarding to the news and, and that wouldn't really be related to the, to the 
um, game briefings that were going on and how the politicians could obviously wangle out of questions as they do. Um, but I think the question is pretty much directed to the news and, and how people consume that and what they feel about the news. So I think it's more related to the media outlets rather than um, them reporting on what politicians say. And we have a question from Jenny that's asked, um, did you look at UK TV media consumption such as ITV and BBC, etc? Um, we didn't. We wanted to keep things um, a, a kind of more of a, a broad level. We do have other services that we can look at um, on, you know, the, the kind of how BBC or ITV or Sky have performed uh, in terms of news or, or kind of uh, channels that people are watching. Um, we have a, a kind of a brand index daily brand tracking survey that allows us to look at that. And we also have um, a kind of, um, uh, we ask people what they watched on TV yesterday so we can ascertain what people are doing and, and, and things like that. But we haven't got that in this survey, I'm afraid. Um, we have a question from Faye. Will you be conducting the survey again to understand the change in subscriptions as we get deeper into the recession? Do you typically expect that subscriptions will decline in a recession? Um, yeah, we, we are likely to do another uh, wave of this. Uh, we're unsure when. In my head, I've kind of got September penciled in, but I might very well look at doing it in October. Um, it, it really, we, we'll see um, when the best, best time to do it is. Um, yeah, as, as we've kind of seen in recessions, people do spend money. Um, it's not like people stop spending money. It's just they're more savvy on what they spend money on. As I said, I think, I remember when we had the credit crunch in 2008, 2009, and we saw that people were becoming very savvy in what they were doing. They weren't necessarily stopped. They were almost more likely to get takeaways than go out to restaurants. And that obviously prompted the likes of Prezzo and Pizza Express and all of those kinds of brands to do, you know, buy one, get one free deals or, or whatever it is. Uh, and that's kind of remained in place until today. So I suspect people will still spend money they will look at reducing some services um, where they want to. Um, and that's why you have, you know, if you're a brand owner, you really need to ensure that your brand is top, um, of top of mind of awareness, because the last thing you want is people to stop using your brand and then ultimately the, client, um, um, you know, the kind of awareness is gone and they, they stop ultimately in using it. So you, you know, people, brands need to spend in a recession, obviously, the marketeers, we, we, we know that marketing is always um, unfortunately um, cut during the recession, but it should be one of the things that is strengthened. We have a question from Mary who has asked, do you think consumers will remain loyal to brands like Disney Plus and Zoom as the landscape evolves in a post lockdown world? I think they'll be loyal up until an extent um, and, and that's essentially Will the next best thing come along and um, then they have to judge, you know, is this brand going to still do it for me or is, it, is that other brand doing things? You know, we've seen that D Disney have such a good uh, brand strength about them anyway that they are always likely to do well um, in, in things like this. And I, I imagine that Disney Plus, the amount of money that they will be spending on marketing will be huge and that will ensure that they kind of weather the storm. Um, other brands will need to kind of ensure that they can do that uh, and ensure that they match their marketing um, budget with other brands. Um, I remember we've done a lot of smartphone research and um, you know, back in the day when uh, HTC were huge, which was around about 2010, Samsung came along and HTC had a much larger share of essentially wallet of, um, than Samsung did of smartphones. Um, but Samsung had a much larger marketing spend. So um, they just essentially beat HTC because they were able to take their share and just um, pump money into the different advertising channels to get those kind of HTC owners to move to, to Samsung's because they were just seeing so much more advertising in comms about how wonderful Samsung's were. So it's going to be a similar kind of situation, um, particularly in a recession where um, you can't rely on consumers always being loyal and take them for granted, you have to ensure that you are always kind of um, yeah, reminding them why your brand is perfect. Thanks, Russell, and I think that wraps up all the questions. Okay.
Well, look, if there are any others, please do um, message us. Um, my, uh, you can contact us on uh, any of the um, kind of um, DMT at yougov.com or Rachel will certainly um, provide more um, kind of ways to communicate to us. But hopefully you enjoyed that. And um, thank you very much.